I'm a good guy for a gal. All right, let's talk about intelligence. Now, we've danced around this topic a little bit so far. We talked about it when we were talking about mating. We talked about it when we were recapitulating the, the recent history of the human species. But now we're going to deal with this question head on. Why have we evolved a brain so big? To explain this, we're going to start with the case of the sea squirt. Uh, that's not what a sea squirt looks like. This is what a sea squirt looks like, broken down by different stages of its life. And the reason I'm breaking it down that way is because the sea squirt faces different challenges depending on the stage of its life. In the early stage of its life, it's a little tadpole-like creature that swims around in the ocean trying to find a rock to attach to. Once it finds that rock, it attaches to it, it stays there, and it just lets food flow into its mouth. So its life becomes much simpler in the later stage of its life than in the earlier stage of its life. And in that earlier stage of its life, it requires a more complex nervous system. So you can see here uh, on your left, it has this nerve cord, which disappears uh, later in its life. The reason for that is because this is a metabolically expensive piece of uh, anatomy to have around. It doesn't need it later in its life. And so what it does is it eats it. It Instead of feeding calories to it, it uses it for its calories uh, itself. The moral of that story is you only need as big a brain as your environment requires and no bigger. And the reason no bigger is because brains are costly and they're particularly costly for human beings. Those costs are broken down into two categories. On the one hand, they're metabolic costs. The fact is you need a lot of energy to drive this power hungry organ in your skull. Humans at rest use a fifth to a quarter of all their energy to just drive the brain. That's much more than you see among our primate cousins and it's much, much more than you see among other mammals. These are expensive. So in order to recruit that many calories for your brain, we had to change our diet. Meat provided a calorically dense source of proteins and fats that was necessary to actually sustain these types of brains in the ancestral environment. Um, what's interesting about that is that in order for us to increase the amount of meat that we had in our diets, prior to having these big brains, we were scavengers. We were able to get a little bit of meat, but we weren't able to engage in the tool use and complex uh, hunting techniques that were required to actually take down game large game. As our brains increased in size, we were more able to do that, which gave us the fuel to increase the brains even further. So it created this iterative process by which we had the uh, both wherewithal and fuel for uh, brain increase. Um, the other aspect is that it created this uh, trade-off uh, where we needed more stores of uh, energy on our body in order to drive the brain. Uh, that led us to need to recruit more fat um, and produce less muscle. Uh, if you've ever seen a chimpanzee without hair, you'll know it's pretty damn jacked. That's a jacked, hairless chimpanzee. Compare that to a human being. Okay, so that's not the fairest representation of a human being because that is usually us at our fattest. If you look at how our body fat ranges during the lifespan, we are at our fattest at that particular point in time. And the reason for that is because that's when we really need to be driving our brain growth. Uh, between the ages of zero and one, basically 60% of uh, all the calories that you take in are going to developing your brain, which means there's only 40%, a minority of all the calories you're eating to do everything else, driving the rest of your body growth as well as everything that you do as a, a little baby rolling around crying, whatever you do. If you look at the diets of uh, our closest ancestor chimpanzees, you can see those in the bottom two rows. You have the chimpanzees and the gorillas. Look at the percentage of calories that come from fat, 6 and 3% respectively. Compare that to a modern American, 33% fat. And we can make our jokes about uh, Americans, but you can see that that's actually within the range of modern foragers, which suggests that that is a natural level of fat that we crave uh, for uh, in our diet. 
for a particular reason, and the reason is to sustain these brains. So like I said, brains are costly metabolically. They're also costly for the mother. So those of you who remember your Bible will know that the uh, curse that was laid on uh, Eve and uh, all her women descendants was for giving the apple of knowledge uh, to mankind, that is intelligence to mankind, was that she would suffer pain in childbirth for all her days. Um, that's what happened. Intelligence has led to a much more harrowing childbirth experience for women. Um, having these big brains required, even at birth, much larger heads than we previously had, and this coincided with a time when women's pelvises were narrowing because of the needs of bipedalism. To walk uh, upright, uh, and to, in particular, run upright, you needed a narrower pelvis. So this is what you see for a chimpanzee giving birth. Lots of space. Not so much space for a human being. The combination of these factors led to something that's called the obstetrics dilemma, which is a trade-off between the tensions of all these different forces pushing against each other. So on the one hand, you have infant brain size, uh, as we've talked about. There must have been some sort of pressure to um, uh, push the selection for these bigger brains. At the same time, you had a elongated dependency period of these infants. Unlike other animals, humans, as you know, are completely juvenile when they're born. They are completely useless when they're born. They can't fend for themselves at all for years. Um, and part of the reason for that is because they have to develop so much that you can't fit all that time in utero. Uh, they often talk about the fourth trimester, right? This is the trimester after they're born when they're still not fully cooked, and but but you had to bring them out because otherwise they would be too big. And so extending that uh, infant dependency period is a cost in and of itself. We also talked about pelvic width. Um, and then the other factor is uh, a mortality in childbirth for both the child and the mother. So here's another dimension of how much harder childbirth is for humans than our cousins. Uh, it lasts a lot longer, a lot longer, and is a lot more painful than it is uh, apparently for the um, chimpanzees, gorillas, and baboons, our other great ape cousins. Um, in the ancestral environment, and actually until relatively recently, uh, the chances of dying for the mother dying in childbirth were 1% per birth. So if you have six or seven kids, that's real danger. And all of these costs mean that there had to be some really good reason for our brains to grow so large. It must have been worth it from an evolutionary perspective. Uh, the math looks something like this. The adaptive benefits of having a giant brain would have had to exceed these metabolic and maternal costs. Moreover, because of the speed at which this increased, you guys remember those charts we saw where after about two million years, brain size just shot up rapidly. The speed at which something increases is a clue towards its uh, adaptive benefit. So the fact that this happened fast must have meant that it was really worth it. So why? Why did it happen? Well, we're going to talk about four theories. Um, Wallace's theory, Darwin's theory, Dunbar's theory, and Joe Henrik's theory. Um, we're mainly going to talk about the middle two today. We'll talk about culture in the next class. Uh, we won't talk about Wallace very much because, as you guys know, at this point, Wallace just threw up his hands. He said, that's too big a leap. Evolution could have done that. Natural selection could have done that. I think some spiritual force had a plan and came in and pushed things along at that stage to uh, develop uh, uh, the human higher mental faculties. Now, Darwin wrestled with this a lot. He's, he wrote uh, to one of his friends, he said, um, every time I gaze upon a peacock's tail, it makes me sick. And it makes him sick because it didn't fit. Why would these ornaments, these seemingly useless ornaments, fit within his elegant theory of natural selection? But it prompted him to come up with the idea of sexual selection, and that's what he invoked to explain the development of the higher human faculties as well. That idea of sexual selection was expanded upon by Ronald Fisher, who was a uh, prominent evolutionist in the uh, early part of the 20th century. He was a key architect of the modern synthesis in evolutionary theory, and he suggested that there could be this runaway process by which 
uh, constant selection, sexual selection for bigger and bigger uh, whatevers would uh, lead to a, a expansion over time, uh, a runaway expansion over time of that particular characteristic. The example that's often given is of the Irish elk. Now this is a bit of an apocryphal story, but the Irish elk really did exist and it really did have these enormous antlers, over two meters wide. Uh, so that's like as tall as the tallest people you meet uh, wide, uh, antlers wise. And the idea there was that the females sexually selected for the males with these big antlers so much that the Irish elk actually went extinct because the antlers reached a level at which um, they could not run or hunt anymore and they became this absurd uh, species that couldn't survive anymore. The implication is that while something similar uh, has happened for humans with regards to our big brains, um, mutual interest in the most intelligent member of your species meant that we were constantly, constantly selecting for those uh, of each kind of litter of humans who had the bigger and bigger brains. And this over uh, a million and a half years led to a rapid expansion, a runaway expansion in the human brain. Now, there's not actually that much support uh, for this idea anymore, even though this was pr proposed by some pretty smart people, Charles Darwin, Ronald Fisher. Part of the reason for that is that you don't tend to see many examples of runaway sexual selection in nature, especially that has in, uh, the characteristic being passed down to both sexes. So what you don't see among humans is this idea that only the men got the sexually selected trait. That's what you typically see, right? The peacock, only the male peacock has the, uh, the, the pl plumage, only the Irish elk had the large antlers. Um, it would be more efficient from a cost perspective to just give the intelligence to the males and preserve those costs, those metabolic and maternal costs for the females. That's not what happens. So it's a sort of a unique situation in um, nature. Secondly, if it was the case that intelligence offered no survival benefits and actually came at the cost of survival benefits, the dynamics of evolution would have led to a class of females who preferentially chose less intelligent males, and then that would have been selected for as well, which would have put a break on uh, the runaway sexual selection process before it got to a level of such uh, absurd intelligence and absurd, absurdly high costs. So the runaway sexual selection theory, as compelling as it might be, has fallen out of favor. So let's then move to Robin Dunbar's social brain hypothesis. Now, Dunbar is a cognitive anthropologist in Britain, and years ago he noticed this interesting relationship that if you look at the primates, the monkeys and the apes, the ones that have the larger brains tend to be the ones that are more social. More specifically, he calculated something called the neocortex ratio, which is the ratio of the newly evolved or new, most recently evolved part of the brain, the, the kind of layered sheath that goes over top all the core functions of the brain, uh, compared to those rest of the core functions. So the ratio of the neocortex to the rest of the brain. And he found that this neocortex predicted the average group size that these monkeys and apes would engage in. So you can see there that there's this pretty tight relationship among monkeys between the size of the neocortex ratio and the average group size. And you see a similar relationship for the apes. What he then did was extrapolated from the neocortex ratio of all the other primates versus the neocortex ratio of humans to see what the ideal human group size would be. And he found that that number came out to 147.8, roughly 150, which has come to be known as Dunbar's number. Dunbar cited this as, as based on our brain, what our natural social group size would be. He then looked at historical sizings of different counties or military units or religious congregations uh, or various other types of social networks and found that they tend to cluster around this number of 150. For instance, he looked at uh, British people's uh, Christmas card networks. And this is how many people that people would send their Christmas cards to. And he found that the average number of recipients that a, uh, that a Christmas card giver would have is 153.5. So very close to that 150 
uh, number, and you see that peak right around 150. Now, I've always worried about these numbers a little bit because you can tell uh, that this is a ripe opportunity for the uh, file drawer effect, which you guys have probably learned in your other classes. It's possible that he just cherry picked these particular examples which fit his uh, Dunbar's number. However, more recent uh, research which has looked at Twitter and Facebook networks, in particular not the number of Facebook friends that you have, but the number of actually active uh, uh, relations that you actually engage with, also clusters around this 100 to 150 to maybe just shy of 200 level. So it does seem like there's something real here. But Dunbar actually took this further. What Dunbar found also correlated with social group size and neocortex ratio is the a percentage of the day that the individual primate would spend engaging in social grooming. So you guys have seen this. This is when uh, the primate will pick the nits out of a, a buddy's back. This is their social time. This is them getting to know each other. And Dunbar found, again, that there was the same sort of relationship. As group size increased, so too did the time spent social grooming. Well, there's more of your uh, buddies out there to spend uh, time grooming. And just as he extrapolated from what we know to be the human neocortex ratio, what we can assume is the human group size, Dunbar also extrapolated what would be the uh, percentage of time that humans would have to engage in social grooming uh, for to match their uh, neocortex size. And he found that the percentage of time spent grooming had to would have had to increase sharply to be maintained at the same level as we see uh, in human group sizes. And in fact, this amount of time spent grooming is unsustainable at this point. And so what Dunbar suggested, and he was getting a little speculative here, was that, well, we needed something else. We needed some more efficient way of getting to know each other than social grooming, which took too long for the numbers of people that we would have to interact with. And so he suggested that at that point, something else needed to develop. And what he suggested initially was that the thing that developed was language. And more specifically, the thing which language is mainly used for, which is gossip. Uh, understanding people's social relationships, understanding what's going on with Dave down the street. He did these eavesdropping experiments where he would sit in a bar and listen to what college students were talking about, sit in the cafeteria, listen to what college students were talking about, and found out that 80% of what they talked about wasn't what they learned in their newest evolutionary psychology class, but was actually this form of networking or gossip, understanding the social relations of the people around them. And so Dunbar's suggestion was that language evolved as this necessary evolutionary step for us to produce this level of human sociality. But what's critical about Dunbar's point is that we're talking about something more than just gossip or networking or language or group size. What we're talking about is the invention of a new type of relationship in the animal kingdom. So there had been love between mothers and children since milk. That came with mammals. That had then been ported over to a romantic type of love between partners. We see that pair bonding among many mammalian species as well as birds. But what Dunbar is arguing here is that what happened with the primates, what happened with these social group sizes, what happened with this social engagement is the invention for the first time of friendship. In other words, you don't get to 147.8 friends without evolving a massive neocortex. That took me a long time to do, so you guys have to see it. It serves zero pedagogical value except to hammer in that number. So to summarize, why a brain so big? In Dunbar's view, it's because of the extraordinary demands of social life, in particular the extraordinary demands of having and understanding your friends. Humans are the most social species on Earth, and that extreme sociality explains the extreme brain size that we also have. But the critical point that we're gonna pick up in the next lecture is that as social as we are and as sophisticated as our brains are, it's not infinite. These are the cognitive limits that we ran up against. 150 is the group size that we ran up against given the constraints on our brain imposed by the obstetrics dilemma. That's what we're gonna pick up on in the next lecture.